open your Bibles to Daniel uh, chapter 4, and I'm going to start around verse 25. Uh, this is going to be something on what I call a, a window of grace, a window that God gives you, and uh, an opportunity to get out of trouble before it comes your way, a window of grace to escape a judgment. All right, it happens here. In Daniel 25, Nebuchadnezzar uh, gets the bad word. Because of his pride, uh, the Lord's going to give him a shot. So uh, let's see what happens in verse 25, Daniel 4:25, that they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over thee. What? Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now, in Daniel 4.25, you see that there's this judgment pronounced on Nebuchadnezzar because of his pride. You know, you look out the window, look at this great Babylon that I built, and look at my glory and all of that, and the Lord just says, okay, that's it. I'm not going to take it from him anymore. He's not going to give glory or credit to God. He's Mr. It, so he's got to learn a lesson. Now, this is, I'm, I'm teaching on this today because this is what a lot of Christians have trouble uh, grasping. You are not the boss, okay? You are not the boss. If you've asked the Lord to save you, the Holy Spirit moved into you, in your body. He wants to be the boss. Uh, you don't want to give up control in many cases. You just don't. That's human nature. So there's a tug of war, and it lasts probably till till the end, till you die or we get raptured. And it's a fact of life in, in the Christian life. You have to accept it. It just goes on. There's a struggle as to who's going to get the control over whom. Uh, John the Baptist, I had said on other broadcasts, uh, it, it, it's a great uh, line that I use continually uh, telling his uh, disciples uh, after they came back and gave a report about Jesus and the ministry that he had and how it was growing, it was obvious to John the Baptist that his time was just about over. And he said, he must increase, I must decrease. That's what you must feel and think and say when you get saved. He begins the process of sanctifying us, separating us unto himself. And that's when the struggle begins brothers and sisters, and it could be a pretty vicious fight, depending upon how stubborn and willful you are, okay? Look at verse 26, and whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree, tree roots, uh, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. In other words, it's going to be a certain amount of time, and when it's uh, over, you're going to know something that you are having trouble comprehending right now. The heavens rule. You don't. God is the boss, okay? You don't, you, uh, get rid of your delusions. I don't care if you're a king of kings and the image of gold and all of that. Uh, set up the statue and have everybody worship you. You are nothing when it comes to the God of heaven and earth. Now, Verse 27, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness. Look how Daniel's speaking to the king. This is Daniel, he's a gutsy Jew. Break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Hmm. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. In other words, act now. Act now and do what you need, what you ought to have done, and things could get better for a while. Things might stay good for a while. There'd be peace in your kingdom. Don't you want that? Yeah, well, this is what you need to do. Now, Christians that hear from God, that want to hear from God, might be getting that message. Stop your fooling around, and things will go a lot better for you. Just give it up. Surrender. And they want to. And verse 28. And all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. All right, that's one year. One year window of grace. Verse 30. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom 
by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Well, in that year that he had, God gave him a year of grace, a window, an opportunity to get right and continue uh, in his kingdom with all the benefits thereof. Uh, No, he blew it. He blew it because, verse 30, he's still walking around. That warning from Daniel went in one ear and out the other. Sound familiar? You see, the whole book, this book from cover to cover is just filled with this stuff. Warning after warning, get right, get right. You say, well, you know, after a while it, it gets tired. No, it doesn't. We have to hear that continually because we're prone to evil. That's just the way it is. And Paul admitted it. In me dwelleth no good thing. It's good that the Lord gets on your back, my back. It says in the psalm, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod comforts you. It's a weapon used to cane you, to hit you. How does that comfort you? It comforts you because you're reminded by that that God cares. That's why he takes the stick to you, because he cares. You know, when I used to teach at Substitute Teaching here in uh, Scambia County, I, I, one time I said to the, the kids, this was middle school, I said, you know, later on you're going to remember more the teachers who got on your back and gave you a hard time as opposed to those that just let you do your thing. You're going to see who you're going to remember, what's going to stick out in your mind. Oh, how many warnings we get. How many times the Lord graciously sends a message to us either when it's reading the bible or hearing a sermon or another christian or even a lost person the lord Lord can speak through uh, a donkey like he did balaam's jackass Uh, we can get all kinds of messages uh and and when it's negative to us and it ruffles us uh, chances are it's from the lord now look at verse 31 while the word was in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven saying O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, thy kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, that seven years, until thou know, until what? Until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever He will. Think of that verse. And think of people like Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler and Mao Zedong and all the animals and beasts that the Lord allowed to have rule over men. You say beasts. Yeah, look at Ecclesiastes. It talks about men being revealed as beasts. Men are shown as beasts. You read about the beasts in Revelation. Uh, The Antichrist called the beast. The beast were beasts. Apart from the grace of God, we're beasts. We're like beasts. It's a hard thing to, you know, some people just can't handle that, especially religious people. Ye who are evil, the Lord said, know how to give good things to your children. I mean, evil? Yeah, evil. You mean religious people? Yeah, religious people. Yes, yes. It's just what drives a person to seek grace from God and mercy. The awareness of their depravity the awareness of, of what, what constitutes uh, their makeup, their heart, the evil that resides in their own heart. I'm not, I'm not talking about outward sins that everybody could point to. I'm talking about the stuff that goes inside the, that's inside the heart. That's hard to detect, the deceitfulness, the envies, the jealousies, the backbitings, the gossip, the slander, uh, the pride, the stubbornness, all the stuff that ferments uh, inside of us. God sees that. God knows about that. But he died for us. And when he comes inside of us, he begins that process of cleaning up. And oh, do we fight him. Oh, do we fight. Carry on like children having their toys and lollipops taken away from them. Now, here's another window of grace. A Revelation, please. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. And there's a verse here in verse 21. Uh, He's talking about, well, starting with verse 18, the church, uh, it's a message from the Holy Spirit to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I'm in Revelation 2, verse 18. This is the fourth church that he's writing to, Thyatira. I know thy works and charity 
and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notice he mentions works twice in this verse and the last to be more than the first. This is a laboring church. This is a church that's doing things uh, for the Lord. This is a church that's productive, very commendable here. But, verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Uh, this is really a, a d horrific uh, denunciation of, uh, by the way, women pastors. Yeah, well, yes, oh, Brother Militello, I thought that might have referred to, you know, Mary and the Catholic Church and, you know, Jezebel. And Yeah, well, it's a little bit connected with that, but more so, let's read it as uh, Bible-believing uh, Baptists here. Let's, let's see this, this stuff that's going on in Pentecostal, charismatic circles, and even uh, established Protestant churches where women more and more are occupying the pulpit. Uh, and, and what's happening? What are they teaching their servants? First of all, they shouldn't be in that position. They shouldn't be in the pulpit teaching anybody. For, if they're married, they should be at home listening to their husbands and allow their husbands to lead them. And if they're not married, come to church and uh, shut up, sit there and shut up, and maybe you'll get lucky and God might point out a, a good man for you uh, to, <laughs> to marry and you could submit yourself to him and learn from him. Uh, but here, it's clear that the, uh, the Lord has a real problem with this. Suffers that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. We had years ago, I don't know if you ever heard of Ellen G. White. She was one of the stars of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, movement. Uh, and Ellen G. White wrote a book. Uh, I forget the name of The Great Controversy or something. She wrote a number of books. She was very knowledgeable. She was slick. She was slick. Uh, but she was off the wall. And she produced, uh, she, she helped grow one of the biggest cults in America, the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, prior uh, to getting that name, uh, believe it or not, they were, they were known as the Millerites. And this goes back into the 1800s in New York State. Again, New York State, the birthplace of a lot of wackos and quacks. You know, the, <laughs> the Spiritist Movement, uh, uh, Joseph Smith and Palmyra and the Golden Plates of Moroni and all that. You had a, a lot of nut jobs uh, from New York State when it came to spiritual things. And by the way, it's still going on. Uh, Reverend Moon had his headquarters up in Tarrytown, New York, the Moonies. A lot of people don't know that. Okay, the Millerites, these were people who followed the Reverend Miller. I believe a Baptist minister who taught that the Lord was coming at a certain day. This was 18, I can't, I got to look it up, 1850-something or whatever. And they all went to this mountain. It might have been later. They all went to this mountain to await the arrival of the Lord, and it never happened. And he changed the dates. And, he, you know, it reminds me of this guy that died a number of years ago, Harold Camping. Uh, he was the head of uh, Family Radio. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Family Radio, Harold Camping. Uh what was that? That was, oh, it, it was, yeah, my, my associate's telling me, 18, 1844, I didn't know it was that early, 1844, amazing. Okay, and, and camping also got in trouble with uh, date setting, you know, he's coming in May, I don't know what it was, 1999 or 2000, I forget now, but it, 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 it was so bad, you know, you, Miller did this, and he, then he said he misinterpreted the book of Daniel. He had to go back and restudy it and comes up with another date. It's like the Jehovah Witnesses. They had all kinds of dates uh, for Christ returning and everything. It all turned out to be nonsense. Very dangerous thing to try and fix a date. We don't know. We, 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 can, we do have a pretty good idea. It's very soon. We know that. We could see it coming. It's right around the corner. It has to be coming soon. But to fix a year... Fix a date? No, no. That's that. You, you, you're going off the, uh, the the ledge over there. So what happened? Ellen G. White. She uh, she made sure the Seventh Day Adventists were uh, uh, growing, and uh, I think this refers to them. They're, believe it or not, uh, there are some safe people that are Seventh Day Adventists. Let me tell you something. And there are some even I believe some Jehovah Witnesses. There's Catholics that are saved. So he's writing to this church, and this church has a problem. 
And what does he say? Uh, uh, seducing my servants to commit fornication. I'm, I'm looking at spiritual fornication here. Although in some churches, uh, who knows? You know what I mean? A, a lot of these holiness churches, look, I'm not slandering anybody. I'm telling you what I know from hearing other Christians. A lot of stuff that goes on there between you and I, brother and sister, is foul. Okay? It's not holy. There's a lot of devilment in these places. And I'm telling you, if a woman is in the pulpit and she's running the congregation, the chances for that devilment to increase are significant. Significantly higher. Let me tell you that, okay? Say it's a, there's a big difference. You, you bet there is. If a woman is running the congregation, devil's going to have a field day in there. Okay, now what do you get in verse 21? And here's the point. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Same thing with Nebuchadnezzar. The same thing with Nebuchadnezzar. You know what's sad here is a lot of Christians right now are in that window of grace. I'm speaking to somebody I know that's in that window right now. How long it's going to last, I don't know. With Nebuchadnezzar, it lasted a year. He didn't do what he needed to do, and the hammer came down on him, and he uh, acted like an animal for seven years. Uh, with this Jezebel in the church, historically in Thyatira, I don't know how long that lasted. I don't know how long this window's going to last for you, or God forbid I wind up in a situation like that. God forbid. But there will be an end. The window will close at a certain point. If you don't make an adjustment while this window is still open, what can I say? You're a fool, and you're going to get what you deserve. Okay? So, Brother Motel, it's uh, not right to talk to Christians like that. No, no, it's, it's perfectly fine. No problem. I have no problem with it. I have to warn you. But my God is a holy God. My God wants to control his people. He has every right to ask them to yield. He bought you with his blood. Now, if you want to keep playing games, what can I say? You're not too bright. Amen? Amen.